the main tiger of Chordi. This is the story of a very big tiger that gave great trouble to the area in which he lived, or rather to the human inhabitants of the area, and was very troublesome to pursue and finally bring to bag. In telling hunting stories, it is the purpose of the teller to keep his hearers interested. To do that he has to relate the efforts that ended successfully in the killing of his quarry. Perforce he has to leave out many of the failures and disappointments he encounters, for if he were to describe them all his listeners would soon be bored. But to mention only the successes is to give the impression that efforts to kill a man-eater, whether tiger or panther, are nearly always crowned with success, nearly always easy, and can nearly always be accomplished within a comparatively short space of time, a few days, at most. In reality, all three of these impressions are very far indeed from the truth, and actual circumstances are invariably quite the opposite. Failures are very many in conditions, physical, mental and nervous, are most arduous, and frequently the animal takes months and even years to catch up with. Sometimes he is never shot. So in this story I am going to tell of a pursuit that began in a casual way and took almost five long and tedious years to bring to a conclusion. Of course it was not a continuous hunt, but a series of sporadic attempts. Between my own efforts there were other hunters from Bangalore and Bombay, not to speak of the local Nimrods, who all attempted to bring about the downfall of this wily creature. And we all failed, until those five years had passed. He was known as the main tiger, because he had an outstanding ruff of hair around his neck, behind his ears and covering his throat and chin. Naturally this outcrop of hair greatly increased the apparent size of his head, which was always described as being that big, the witness stretching out his hands sideways, with fingertips inwardly curved, though very few persons had seen him and lived to tell the tale. His original habitat was known to be around Chordi, because that was the name of the village where he was first seen and near to which he made his first human kill. Chordi is a small roadside hamlet, surrounded by jungle, about four miles from the little town of Kumsi, which itself is 16 miles from Shimoga, the capital town of the district bearing the same name, in the state of Mysore. Shimoga is just 172 miles by a good road from Bangalore. Nearly 70 miles of this road, at the Bangalore end, is of concrete and the rest is tarred, so that a motorist can generally and safely, with the exception of a few nasty, unexpected bends, make quite good time to Shimoga. From there the road goes on to Kumsi and Kordi, then to the village of Anandapuram about 9 miles further on, then 11 miles to the town of Sagar, and thence about 16 miles, past another village named Talagapa, to the famous Gursopa waterfalls, sometimes known as the Jog Falls, where the waters of the Sharavati River descend 950 feet in four separate cascades. That is a sight to be remembered and one that has inspired feelings of awe and reverence in the hearts of the most callous and materialistic of men. There are two travellers' bungalows at the head of the falls. The one on the southern bank of the Sharavati River, which is by far the more modern building, falls within the boundary of Mysore state and is appropriately called the Mysore bungalow. The opposite bungalow, across the river and on its northern bank, comes under the jurisdiction of Bombay state. It is an older building, very isolated and seldom occupied, for which reason I much prefer it. It is known, of course, as the Bombay Bungalow. It is rather unusual, and amusing, to find the visitors' books in both bungalows crammed with efforts to write poetry by the various people who have stayed in them from time to time. Undoubtedly the grandeur of the falls has been the cause of awakening this latent desire to wax poetical in minds that perhaps have hitherto remained indifferent. Some of their efforts are really laudable and inspiring, but for the rest I feel it would be difficult anywhere else to assemble such a pile of drivel in one place. The depredations of the tiger accorded very closely with the pattern of events usually associated with the careers of man-eaters. From being a hunter of the natural game animals that live in the jungle, he gradually became a cattle lifter, tempted no doubt by the presence of the thousands of fat kine that are grazed in the reserved forests all over the Shimoga district. Their presence, and the ease with which he could stalk and kill them, in contrast with the difficulties of creeping up on other wild animals, was the first step that changed him from being an inoffensive game killer into an exceedingly destructive menace to the herdsmen around Cordy. 
Attack followed attack as cattle were killed by the main tiger, till the normal lethargy of the keepers was sufficiently ruffled to decide to do something about it. Matters came to a head when a more enterprising cattle owner carried his loaded shotgun into the forest with him when he took his animals there for grazing, although it was against the forestry department's regulations for him to enter the reserve with a weapon but without a game shooting license. However, he did just that, and as luck would have it, the main tiger chose that very day to attack and bring down one of his animals. From a position behind the trunk of a tree he let fly with his shotgun, and the LG pellets badly injured the tiger along his right flank. He disappeared from the vicinity of Cordy for the time being, and all the cattle men were grateful to the owner of the shotgun for ridding him of such a menace. Then the maimed one reappeared a few miles away, in the shrub jungle that borders Anandapuram. But he still clung to his habit of attacking cattle grazing in the reserve. He had not yet been spoiled, had not yet become a man-eater, because the wound in his side had not incapacitated him in any way. Once again his unwelcome presence forced itself upon the attention of the cattle grazers, and once more he was wounded. This time in his right foreleg, and from a machin as he was approaching the carcass of a cow he had killed the previous day. He vanished for the second time. Once more false hopes were raised that his departure was permanent, and once again he reappeared. However, there was a difference with his second return. No longer was he the obnoxious but nevertheless inoffensive tiger that had been so destructive to cattle, but harmless to their attendants. This time it was the other way round. The cattle were comparatively safe, but the herdsmen were in danger, in very great and real danger because he had become the greatest scourge and terror that any jungle can produce, a man-eating tiger. The ball that had entered his right foreleg had smashed a bone. Nature had healed the bone, but the limb had become shortened and twisted. No longer could he stalk his prey silently and effectively, no longer could he leap upon them and bring them crashing to earth with broken necks. His approach was noisy, his attack clumsy, his ability to hold his prey was greatly hampered by his deformed limb, and very often they escaped. Even the dull cattle heard his approach and eluded him, or shook him from their backs when he attacked. Because of his disability he became thin and emaciated, and he was faced with starvation. He, the big maned tiger, was forced to try to catch the rats that ran in the bamboo trees, and even they escaped him. The only living things that were not too fast for him were the slimy frogs in the pools of scum-covered water stagnating here and there in the jungle, and the sharp-shelled crabs by the water's edge, and men. Sheer necessity, and nothing else, drove him to this new diet of human flesh. These are the facts about this tiger as I gathered them from time to time. The nature of his wound I only discovered for myself when years later I examined him after I had shot him. Thus one day a man alighted at Anandapuram bus stand and began a jungle journey to a tiny hamlet three miles away. He had left the previous morning to go to Shimoga town, and had told his wife to keep his midday meal ready for him the next day, as he would be back in time. The meal was prepared accordingly, but he did not appear. This caused no untoward alarm in the little household, because the settlement of business affairs in India, particularly in the lesser towns, is often protracted. Time is of little or no consequence in the East. Even that evening he did not turn up, nor during the whole of the following day. On the third day his eldest son, a grown lad, was sent to Shimoga to find out what had delayed his father. There he was told that the transaction had been completed three days earlier and that his father had left to return to his home. Still no untoward anxiety was felt, as it was thought he might have gone to Sagar, which is beyond Anandapuram, in connection with the same affair. Five days thus passed without a sign, when the family became really anxious and alarmed. The consensus of opinion was that he had been set upon and robbed by badmashes or decoits on his way home through the jungle and probably killed. The police were informed and a search was made, which brought to light a slipper lying among the bushes beside the track to the hamlet where he lived. The old slipper was identified by the household as belonging to the missing man, and that gave further credence to the decoit theory. Several known depredators, decoits, living in Anandapuram were taken to the police station and questioned. They avowed their innocence. A closer and wider search was then made. 
Shreds of clothing and dried blood marks were discovered on thorns and bushes, and across the dry bed of Anullah the pug marks of a tiger. Thereafter, no traces were apparent. Tigers are, or rather were in those years, quite common in those areas, and as there was no direct evidence to connect the pug marks with the missing man, there was only a very vague suspicion that a tiger might have had anything to do with his disappearance. The presence of the pug marks might have been purely coincidental. The mystery was never solved. A fortnight later a lone cyclist was pedaling the four miles from Kumsi to Kordi. Half a mile from his destination, the road crosses the river by a bridge. A parapet of limestone, or tunum as it is called, flanks the road. Looking over as he was riding along, the cyclist saw a tiger drinking almost below him. He was at a safe distance from the animal so, applying his brakes, he sat in his saddle with one foot on the parapet and watched the tiger. The tiger finished drinking, turned and began to reclimb the bank. In a couple of seconds he would disappear in the undergrowth, so for the fun of it the cyclist shouted, shoo shoo. The tiger stopped, looked backwards over his shoulder and up at the cyclist, snarled and growled loudly. Very hastily, the man removed his foot from the parapet, applied it to the pedal, and rode as fast as he could to Cordy, where he told his friends that along the road he had met a very nasty tiger indeed which had tried to attack him. Only by God's grace had he escaped. There was a lull for the next month or so, and then occurred the first authenticated human killing. This happened at a place called Tapur, which is almost midway between Cordy and Anandapuram. It is a little roadside hamlet, and one of the women had taken her buffalo down to the stream behind the village so that it might take its morning bath. It appears that the buffalo was lying in the water with only its head above the surface, as is the usual habit with buffaloes, when a tiger attacked the woman who was sitting on the bank watching her protege. Another woman from the village had just drawn water from the stream and had spoken a few words to the woman sitting beside her buffalo and was passing on. She had scarcely gone a hundred yards when she heard a piercing shriek and looked back in time to see a tiger walking off with her erstwhile companion in his mouth. Tiger and victim vanished into the jungle while the other woman threw down her water pot and raced for the huts. What happened was usual with most incidents of this kind. Considerable time elapsed in collecting a sufficient number of men brave enough to go out to look for the woman. Eventually this was done and they found her, or rather what was left of her. That was the beginning, and thereafter followed a sequence of human victims, whose deaths took place as far away as the road leading to the Bombay bungalow near the Jog Falls on the further side of the Sharavati River. Officialdom moves slowly, and it was a considerable time before the reserved forests in these regions were thrown open to the public for shooting this beast. A number of enthusiasts turned up and the Bombay presidency was well represented amongst them. They tried hard and diligently, but luck did not come their way. This particular tiger did not seem to be tempted by the cattle and buffaloes tied up as live bait. Meanwhile the human killings continued. A friend of mine named Jack Horton, who went by the nickname of Lofty, for the very reason that he was about 6 foot 4 inches tall and proportionately broad made up his mind to have a try at shooting this animal and asked me to accompany him. As far as I can remember, this trip was undertaken about one year after the tiger had turned man-eater. It so transpired that for some reason or the other, most probably because I had already used the leave due to me, I went with him for only a week, telling him I would have to return after that time. We travelled in his 1931 model Ford car, and the arrangement was that I should return to Bangalore by train after the week had expired, while he would remain for a full month or so. We motored from Bangalore to Shimoga and stopped there for half a day in order to visit the district forest officer, Sagar Forest Range, where these killings had been taking place, to find out the names of the different places where people had been attacked and the exact dates of those attacks, in order to establish, if possible, by studying the sequence of the attacks, the precise, beat, being followed by this tiger. I have already explained that man-eating tigers generally pursue a definite course or itinerary when they become man-eaters. By noting the names of the villages or localities where they kill on a map, with the date of each incident, it is frequently possible to work out the beat for oneself, and forecast roughly in which direction or area the tiger may be at about the time one undertakes to try and bag him.
Our study of events on a map indicated very clearly that this tiger kept within a few miles of the roadside and operated up and down between Kamsi and the further bank of the Sharavati River, as far as the Bombay bungalow. This is a very densely forested region with many scattered hamlets, whose occupants are almost entirely devoted to grazing big herds of cattle. A large number of these animals are always killed in these areas each month by both tigers and panthers, so this fact made it difficult to find out whether our man-eater also killed cattle or not. We felt that it was almost certain he did so, as the human kills were too few and far between for him to have subsisted only on a human diet. Our opinion was quite contrary to the local one, which was that he would not touch any domestic animals. Lofty chose to make his camp at a small forest bungalow situated half a mile from the Tapur hamlet. It is a picturesque little lodge, standing in the jungle about 200 yards from the roadside, and the forest in the vicinity is crammed with game, particularly spotted deer. In that year some of the stags carried magnificent heads and we came across quite a few outstanding specimens. Lofty started operations in the routine fashion by buying three animals for bait. Two of them were young buffaloes, and the other a very old and decrepit bull. One buffalo was tied near the stream where the cyclist had seen the tiger. The aged bull was tied at about the spot where the woman of Tapur had been carried off. The remaining buffalo we had taken and tied near Anandapuram along the same path that the man who had disappeared had been following on his way home. Having completed these arrangements, we motored on to jog and arranged two baits there both buffaloes, tying one of them half a mile or so from the Bombay bungalow and the other on the southern bank of the Sharavati, near the spot where the river is crossed by a ferry plying between the bungalow on the Mysore bank and the Bombay bungalow. This ferry crosses the river about a mile above the waterfalls. Lofty had therefore five baits in all, and I remember they cost him quite a bit of money. The plan was that we should spend alternate nights at the Tapur Forest Lodge and the Bombay bungalow, checking the baits closest to the place where we had spent the previous night before setting out by car for the bungalow where we would spend the next night. My calculations, made by the method of checking the dates of the human kills, which were now nine in number, seemed to indicate that this tiger might be somewhere in the middle of this region between Sagar and Anandapuram. So on the third day I bought a buffalo myself, which I then tied up about halfway between these two places and within a furlong of the main road. We tied this animal about two in the afternoon on our way from the Tapua bungalow to jog. Very early next morning we looked up the two baits tied in the vicinity of the waterfalls. Both were alive, so we set out for Tapua, halting en route to visit the buffalo I had tied up the previous afternoon. It had been killed by a tiger. Lofty, being a good sportsman and considering the fact that I had paid for this buffalo, insisted that I should take the shot. But I knew how keen he was and so quite an argument arose. Finally we tossed for it, and Lofty won. Leaving him up a tree, sitting uncomfortably perched in a fork, I drove to Tapua Lodge to fetch his Mackin, which we had both most thoughtlessly forgotten to take with us on that important day. Lofty's contraption was nothing more than a square bamboo frame about four feet each way, interlaced with broad navary tape. At each of the four corners was a loop of stout rope which helped when tying the affair to a tree. I also brought three men from Tapua Hamlet along with me to assist in putting up this Mackin. We ate a cold lunch by the roadside while the men made a good job of fixing the Mackin and camouflaging it with branches. Lofty then had a nap in the back seat of the car till four o'clock, while I chatted with the three men. This was because, being close to the road, we knew the tiger would not put in an appearance before nightfall. At four I woke him up and he climbed into the Mackin with all his equipment. His weapon was a 8mm Mauser rifle, a really neat and well-balanced job, which Lofty affectionately calls, Shorty Bill. Wishing him good luck and saying I would be back by dawn, I drove to Tupper, where I left the three men and then returned part of the way to spend the night at the small dark bungalow at Anandapuram which was closer to where I had left Lofty over the dead buffalo. By break of day next morning I had reached the spot on the road opposite where he was sitting and tooted the horn of the car. He cooed back to me, which was the signal we had agreed upon before parting to signify that all was well. I set out for his tree and met him halfway, walking towards the car. 
He told me the good news that he had shot the tiger, which had turned up much earlier the previous evening than we had expected, arriving just after dark. I was very happy at his success, while Lofty himself was in raptures and simply bubbling over with joy and excitement. I went with him to see the tiger, which was a beautiful large male in the prime of life and handsomely marked with bold, dark stripes. But I noticed that the he was a very normal tiger. He certainly did not possess the distinctive mane which the official government notification had said was the outstanding characteristic of the man-eater. I was surprised to find that in his enthusiasm over his own success Lofty had apparently quite overlooked this fact and I just did not have the heart to tell him. I congratulated him very heartily on his success and tried my best to appear sincere. Then leaving him to guard his precious trophy, I motored back to Tapua to bring four men and a bamboo pole for lifting the carcass. Returning with the men, we tied the feet of the tiger to the pole and carried him upside down to the car. As Lofty had no proper carrier at the back that was strong enough to support the weight, we spread eagled the carcass across the bonnet of the car, not only bending the metal in the process, but making it very difficult to drive as, in spite of his height, Lofty could not see the road ahead for some yards because of the body on the bonnet. In driving through Anandapuram, Lofty stopped to exhibit his prize to the townsfolk who crowded around, and it was then that disillusionment very cruelly came to him. For, no sooner did the people look at the tiger than they exclaimed, But, Sahib, this is not the man-eater. Of course it is, replied Lofty indignantly. What other tiger can it be? And in any case, how are you so sure it is not the man-eater? Where is the mane? They asked in justification. The mane? Lofty looked blank at first. Then understanding crept into his eyes. Finally he looked at me accusingly. I forgot all about the mane, he admitted. I have shot the wrong tiger. You knew all the time. Yes, Lofty, I knew, I admitted. But you were so happy when I met you this morning and you told me you had bagged the man-eater, that I just did not have the heart to disillusion you. The main was the first thing I looked for. Of course, there was nothing else you could have done but shoot. And then, to make it seem more convincing, I hastily added. After all, the tiger came when it was dark and you could not look for a mane even by torchlight. In any case, it is a magnificent specimen and a trophy to be proud of. So cheer up, old chap. But Lofty was not so easily consoled. We drove to Tapua, where I found him so disheartened as not to be in the least interested in supervising the skinning of the tiger, which he left entirely to me. I watched the men at work while Lofty lay moping in an armchair. Several times I tried to buck him up by drawing his attention to the large teeth and claws of the animal, its dark markings and other aspects, but he was not at all interested and refused to be drawn into conversation. He just said, had I known it was not the man-eater I would not have shot the poor brute. Instead of throwing off his gloom, Lofty got more gloomy as the day wore on. Then he announced that, if no kills had taken place by next morning, he would like to return to Bangalore. We were up early next day, but the three baits at our end of the line were all unharmed. Accordingly, we resold them to their previous owners, as already arranged, at about a quarter of the price which Lofty had paid for them. Then we drove to the jog end of the beat, but both buffaloes were alive there also. We made the same deal with their owners as we had done at Tapur, and late afternoon saw us in the A model on our way back to Bangalore. For some time after this I did not come across any news of this tiger. It was over a year later, I think, that I read in the papers that a charcoal burner had been killed and wholly eaten by a tiger quite near to Cumsee town and almost by the roadside. So I wrote to the district forest officer, at Shimoga, requesting him to keep me informed about future kills by telegram if possible. The forests of Shimoga district, unlike those to the southwest of Mysore state, and in the Madras and Chittor districts, are heavily sprinkled with villages and hamlets, and widely interspersed with cultivation, particularly great stretches of paddy fields. The roads are also far more used, both by vehicular and pedestrian traffic. Because of all this, not only may a tiger be anywhere at all and difficult to locate, but tracking is left to the individual hunter's own skill. It is a strange fact that no aboriginal forest tribes inhabit this area, unlike the other jungles of India. 
The only people who go into the forests are coolies, of Malayali origin, hired in large numbers from the west coast of India. Next to them in number are the Lambanis. These last are the Gypsy tribe of India, who strangely resemble their Romani cousins in the Western world. But only the women are distinctive in appearance. They are lighter in color than the local people and dress picturesquely, with many ornaments, big, white bone bangles, necklaces of beads of all colors, shapes and sizes, nose rings, earrings and rings on their fingers and rings on their toes. They do not wear the sari in the same fashion as the other women of India, but a distinctive costume, made up of a very widely skirted sort of petticoat, covered by a very tightly fitting backless jacket, often displaying an ill-restrained bosom, over which a large shawl-like cloth is draped that covers the head and shoulders. The two halves of their jackets are held together by strings at the back. The Lambani men, on the other hand, are darker than the women and dress very ordinarily. In fact, almost exactly like the rest of the local villages, who are canneries. They wear rather nondescript loose turbans, and very ordinary or dirty white cotton shirts, covering short pants or a loin cloth tied high about their waists. Their knees and calves are generally uncovered, but rough leather sandals protect their feet against thorns. A curious fact is that the men and women among the gypsies of southern India do not resemble each other in either facial or other physical appearances. Most of the women are as graceful and handsome in features as the men are ungraceful and plain. They are an outstanding tribe of people and have preserved their individuality very strongly throughout the centuries. I am myself surprised at this as the laziness of the men is such that one would have expected the tribal distinctiveness to have died away generations ago. It is entirely to the women that must go the praise for prizing their own traditions, and their picturesque dress and appearance, keeping the tribe and its customs so well defined throughout the years. These Lambanis, as a whole, are nomads and do not stay in one place for long. They prefer their own encampments of small grass huts in cleared spaces to life in the regular villages. As a rule they are not of much worth and they certainly do not excel as trackers. At the same time, the credit must be accorded to them of being far more cooperative than the local canneries. Among the Lambanis, both men and women are hard drinkers, distilling their own very potent liquor from the bark of the babel tree, or from rice, bananas and brown sugar combined, or from the jamun fruit after it has been soaked in sugar, or, for that matter, from almost any material they can find and they are most ingenious at discovering sources. They will work more willingly in return for wages in kind, mainly food and drink, than for money, which in any case will be mostly spent in purchasing liquor, if they are unable to make it for themselves. However, they are a nice people, and one of India's finest exhibits among the very many interesting races and tribes of curious and distinctive appearance. The coffee plantations and orange estates in western Mysore owe much to the Lambanis, particularly the women, who form the bulk of the labor employed by them. The remainder of the labor comes from the west coast, from people of Malayalam and Mopla stock. These west coast coolies have one trait in common. They are bound by unbreakable bonds to their homes among the coconut trees, lagoons, rivers and breakers that tumble on the western shores. It is indeed a beautiful country, and I can well understand their fondness for it. Lack of industry and lack of work of any definite sort drives them into the interior in search of employment. But no sooner have they earned and saved some more, for, unlike the Lambanis, they are very thrifty, then back they go to their homeland to enjoy some months of lazy comfort. This universal characteristic makes them rather unreliable as plantation coolies, because one cannot be sure of their regular attendance unless a portion of their pay is held back as a sort of bond. The law forbids this practice to estate owners, while on the other hand the usual system is to grant advances to the coolies to enable them to buy stocks of gram and other foodstuffs, blankets and odds and ends. As can well be imagined, this is welcomed by the Malayali coolies, who draw their pay and whatever advances they can collect and then disappear on French leave to their coastland areas. And so the planters encourage, and have come to rely upon, the humble and picturesque Lambani gypsy as a mainstay on the estates. For them he has become almost a must. My personal interest in this state of affairs lay only in the fact that I would have to rely almost solely on my own initiative if and when I went after this tiger. 
As good as they are as estate workers, Lambanis are not on a par with the other Aboriginal jungle tribes, like the Pujaris, Shulagas, Kurumbas and Chenkis, in tracking and general jungle law. I only wished this tiger was operating in one of the other forest districts where I had willing and experienced helpers to rely upon. A month or so after writing to the DFO at Shimoga I received from him a letter of thanks and the news that the tiger had attacked and killed a woman who had been gathering leaves from the teak trees that grew by the roadside about midway between Kumsi and Chordi. For the benefit of those who have not seen the teak tree or its leaves, I should tell you that the latter are large in size and tough in fiber. They do not tear easily. Hence they are much favored for the manufacture of leaf plates, on which meals, particularly rice, are served in Indian hotels. Some four or five teak leaves go to make one such plate, which is an enormous affair by all Western standards. They are joined together at the edges, either by being stitched with a needle and thread, or more frequently by being pinned together with two-inch long bits of broom grass. These plates are required in hundreds of thousands to supply the demands of the many eating houses in Mysore state. Hence their manufacture forms quite an industry in some of the localities where teak trees grow in abundance. The forest department sells the right of plucking these leaves to contractors, who bid at an auction for that right. The contractors in turn employ female labor and pay the women a certain sum of money per thousand good leaves plucked. Women are hired for this work rather than men as they ask only about half the rate. The DFO concluded his long missive with a statement expressing his hope that I would come to come see to try and kill the man-eater. The extent of the area in which the tiger operated, and even more the other conditions I have already explained at some length, made me feel that the quest was pretty hopeless at this stage. Also the question of leave was a great problem. Searching for a tiger under such circumstances might take several weeks, if not some months. So I set myself the task of writing a very diplomatic reply. While profusely thanking the forest officer for his letter, I endeavored to convince him of the time factor involved in trying to locate or pin down the man-eater in any particular locality. I explained that I did not have the time to spare just then to undertake a prolonged trip. I also suggested that he inform all forest stations and police stations in the area to warn the inhabitants to beware of the man-eater, and to move in daylight only and in groups, keeping to the main roads, also that grazers and contractors' coolies should temporarily cease operation. Should another human kill occur, I suggested he ask the police, as well as his own subordinates, to urge the relatives of the unfortunate victim to leave his or her remains untouched and send me a telegram. I also suggested that the forestry department might materially help by sanctioning the purchase of half a dozen buffaloes, and to tie him out at intervals along the area where the tiger operated. I promised to come, upon receiving telegraphic news of a fresh victim, be it animal or human, on the condition that the body of the victim had been allowed to remain where the tiger last left it. Back came the response to this letter on the third day. It deeply regretted that I had been unable to come, and added that it would be impossible to ensure that all the villagers living in such a wide area followed the precautions I had suggested. Further, relatives would not consent to the body of the loved one being left out in the jungle as a bait to entice the manita to return. They would demand that they should remove and cremate it at once. Lastly, he said that there was no provision under the rules whereby the forestry department could undertake the expense of buying six live buffaloes for tiger bait. Of course, I had anticipated the replies I would receive to these two suggestions. As a matter of fact, I had merely made him to bring home indirectly the problem I was up against in looking for the tiger, which was like searching for a needle in a haystack. That first letter, asking me to come to come see at once, gave the impression that the writer had perhaps overlooked some of the snags involved, and I wanted him to appreciate my side of the picture. Nothing more happened for the next few weeks and then the man-eater struck again, this time making a double kill between Cordy and Tapur. News of this tragedy came to me in a telegram from the DFO, quite a long one, which stated that the tiger had attacked a woodcutter and his son on the high road opposite the Karadibeta Tiger Preserve near Chordi. He had killed the man and carried off the son. Would I please come at once? The Karadibeta Tiger Preserve borders the northern side of the road here. It is a large block of teak and mixed jungle, 
set aside by the order of His Highness the Maharaja of Mysore and the State Forestry Department to provide a sanctuary, where shooting is not allowed. The enlightened ruler of this state, with the advice and cooperation of his far-sighted and equally enlightened chief conservator, has allocated forest blocks in different districts of Mysore state as game sanctuaries for the preservation of wildlife. In such places, shooting is strictly forbidden. This advanced policy of Mysore state was a brilliant example to the rest of India of how a far-sighted ruler and his able assistant have pioneered in game preservation. Such initiative may well be emulated throughout the subcontinent, where wildlife of every kind is being rapidly shot out. In this particular case, perhaps, the man-eater had broken the rules of the game by taking refuge in the sanctuary, intended to be the home of well-behaved normal tigers. I thought I would go and see for myself, as it was significant that the majority of human kills had occurred between Kumsi and Anandapuram. The Karadibeta sanctuary is almost at the hub of this area. I left Bangalore very early in the morning next day, after getting together the necessary kit for a 10-day stay in the jungle, which was the longest I could afford to be absent from town. Owing to large sections of the road being under construction for concreting, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon before I could reach the DFO at Shimoga, where I halted briefly to thank him for his communications. He was good enough to afford me still further assistance by handing me two letters addressed to his subordinates, the forest range offices stationed at Cum C and at Cordy. One directed him to render me all possible help, particularly in purchasing live baits, which is sometimes a bit difficult in Mysore state, while the other ordered him to permit me to go armed into the game sanctuary at Karadibeta in pursuit of the man-eater. Once more I thanked him and then hastened on to drive the 16 miles to Cum C. The range officer there, after reading his superior's letter, assured me of the utmost cooperation and said he would come along in the car with me to Cordy to meet his brother officer, the ranger stationed at that place. We covered the next few miles in a short time. The range officer at Cordy was a Mangalore Christian. That is to say, he came from the town of Mangalore on the west coast, one of the earliest seats of Christianity in India. He was most enthusiastic about helping me, and called his subordinates at once and asked him to summon the other woodcutters who had witnessed the incident in order that I might talk to them. These men arrived after a few minutes and related the following story. A contractor at Shimoga had recently purchased the right to fell trees in a certain sector of the forest, a mile from Tapua for charcoal burning. He engaged the services of both of them, as well as of the woodcutter who had been killed and his 17-year-old son. They all had their homes in Shimoga, but had decided to live temporarily at Cordy village, while the felling operations in the area lasted. They had risen early in the morning of the day when the killing had taken place, which was now two days earlier, and had set forth to walk the three miles to where the felling was being done. They were passing by the Karadibeta block, which was on their right-hand side, when the son asked his father for a pan leaf to chew. I would like to interrupt my story here for a minute or two, for the benefit of those who do not know what the pan leaf is. It is the longish heart-shaped leaf of the Betelvine creeper and is a great favorite among all classes of people in southern India, more particularly among the laborers. It is made into what is known as a beda. On the outspread leaf some chunam or white lime is placed, together with three to four tiny pieces of the araka nut, which is called supari perhaps a few shreds of coconut and some sugar. The beetle, or pan leaf, as it is called, is then wrapped around the ingredients and well chewed. The white lime and the supari causes saliva to flow copiously and colors it blood red. As they walk along chewing, these people expectorate freely, leaving blood red marks from their saliva on walls, pavements, and indeed everywhere. Europeans, who are newcomers to India and see traces of these marks everywhere, are generally thunderstruck at what they sometimes think to be the large number of cases of advanced tuberculosis in the country. Returning to our story, the father stopped to hand the leaf to his son. To do so, he first had to remove it from the corner of his loincloth where it had been kept tied up in a knot. Meanwhile, the other two men had walked on. They heard a roar and looked back to see the son lying on the road with a tiger on top of him, while the amazed father stood by, his hand still extended in the act of offering the pan to his son. They then saw the father perform a magnificent art. 
which was to be the last of his life and the supreme sacrifice. The old man rushed forward, waving his arms about, shouting at the tiger to frighten it off. What happened next was very quick. The tiger left the boy for a moment and whisked around on the father, leaping upon him and biting fearfully and audibly at the man's throat and chest. Blood gushed like a fountain from the father's gaping wounds. Then leaving him lying on the road, the tiger leaped back upon the son, who was sitting up dazedly watching his father being done to death. At that juncture the spell was broken and the two men turned tail and ran as fast as they could to Tapua, nor did they once look back to see what had happened to the boy or his father after the last scene they had witnessed. Tapua, as I related, is quite a small hamlet. Besides, nobody there possessed a firearm. So a dozen men set forth to Anandapuram to tell the police and call someone with a gun. It chanced that on the way they met a lorry going towards Cordy to collect sand from the stream where it passed under the bridge, at the spot where the cyclist had seen a tiger some time previously. The men stopped the lorry and asked the driver to turn around and take them quickly to Anandapuram so that they could report what had happened. But the driver was an exceptionally bold individual, or at least appeared to be so. If they would all get into his lorry, he would drive down the road to the spot where this fairy tale, as he openly described it, had taken place. Then they would all see what they would see. What about the tiger? Somebody had asked. You have an open truck. Supposing it jumps in amongst us and kills some of us. Brother, the driver had announced, stoutly, I am here. So you have nothing and no one to fear. Do you think I shall be idle, waiting for the tiger to jump? I shall run my truck over the brute in a jiffy. Thus encouraged by the brave words of the driver, the twelve men had climbed onto the lorry. Very soon they had reached the spot. I was told the driver was really surprised when he saw the father lying on the road in a great pool of his own blood, quite dead by that time. He had thought the whole story had been concocted from beginning to end. Of the son there was absolutely no trace. The driver had lost a good deal of his self-confidence by this time. The thirteen men stopped long enough to put the dead body of the elder woodcutter into the lorry. Then they had driven to Cordy at top speed. There they had picked up the range officer and driven on to Come See where, after some slight delay, they were reinforced by the Come See range officer and the sub-inspector of police. The whole party had proceeded in the lorry to Shimoga where detailed reports were made to the police and to the forestry department. A perfunctory post-mortem, for the sake of formalities, was held on the woodcutter and his body was handed over to his relatives late that night. Next day a party of armed police returned in the same truck to look for the sun. It was said that a blood trail could be seen, and a drag mark where the man-eater had carried his victim through the bushes and into the game sanctuary. After that, nobody appeared to be competent enough in woodcraft to follow the trail, so that the police party returned to Shimoga that evening to report that they had failed to recover the body of the son. And that, as far as I could see, was the complete story of the tiger's latest exploit, as I was able to gather the details from the two woodcutters who had been eyewitnesses to the whole episode and the subsequent events. The Cordy range officer served coffee after which he and his colleague who had accompanied me from Come See, together with the two woodcutters and myself, set out for the scene of the attack on the roadside opposite the Karadibeta Tiger Preserve. I had often travelled along this road before, and this was the second occasion on which a tiger I was after had taken refuge within this game sanctuary. The first time had been when a wounded animal from the village of Gaoya had made for the sanctuary, and I was able to bag it just before it had entered within the boundary which story I have related elsewhere. The range officers had visited the place already and were able to point to the exact spot where the tiger had made his attack on the father and son. Traffic had been considerable and all traces of blood had been obliterated during the intervening three days under the wheels of the many buses, trucks, private cars and bullock carts that had traversed the road. The sanctuary itself starts a few yards from the road in the form of a teak plantation. The trees at that time were of nearly uniform height, about 20 feet tall, having been planted in straight lines by the Mysore Forestry Department some 10 to 15 years previously. The plantation extended thickly into the sanctuary for about two furlongs before it gave way abruptly to the natural jungle. Tracking beneath the teak trees, 
for traces of a wounded animal leaving a distinct blood trail, is next to impossible. The ground is carpeted with fallen and dried leaves which take or leave no impression. In this case, the boy the man-eater had carried had apparently bled but little. Although the woodcutters pointed out the exact spot where the beast and its victim had disappeared, we were able with diligent searching to find only three places where blood had dripped onto the teak leaves. It was not worth wasting time on a further search. I knew the sanctuary extended northwards through a stream and cart track that connected the village of Gaia on the west with another village named Amligola to the east. The cart track and stream formed the northern boundaries of the sanctuary proper, although the jungle itself extended for many more miles. A wise plan appeared to be to tie four live baits on the four boundaries of the sanctuary, and another at its center, as I had obtained special permission to shoot this tiger within this hallowed area if occasion arose. I told the two range officers that I would need their cooperation in procuring these five baits, as past experience in this area made me rather skeptical of being able to get as many as five animals because the people opposed the sacrifice of cattle as baits and would not cooperate. They told me not to worry and that they would have the baits sent to me by nine o'clock the following morning. At Come See is a forest lodge the one at which the emergency operation had been performed to amputate the arm of the Reverend Jarvis after being mauled by a tiger. I decided to camp at this bungalow, and asked the Kamsi range officer to let me see the baits he could get before having them driven to Cordy to join the others which his counterpart at Cordy had undertaken to procure. I did this because I am quite particular about the live baits I use. Very sick or aged cattle, already close to death's door, are often palmed off to a sahib as bait. He then wonders why the tiger does not readily kill them. But the tiger is a shikari and a gentleman, like the sahib himself, and not a jackal to be satisfied with a diseased bag of bones. My companions had been very fidgety while I had been talking about the baits, for it was six o'clock and the shades of night were fast approaching. I had not been unduly nervous, however, as I knew we were safe as long as the five of us kept close together. We threaded our way through that dense teak plantation in a very closely knit bunch, I can assure you, till we regained the car standing on the road. It did not take long to drop the cordy officer and the two woodcutters at the former's residence, and we were back at Come See in less than 15 minutes. I slept soundly at the forest lodge that night and went across early next morning to the RO's quarters to see how he was getting along with the job of buying the baits. Despite his confidence of the evening before, I felt that with all his influence as a local forest officer, he had underestimated the difficulties he faced. It was as well I went there, for he had not yet started on the job. To cut a long story short, it was past 10 a.m. before he had got three animals together. One was a buffalo calf. The two others were scraggy old bulls. I did not at all approve of the latter, but range officer said it was the best he could do. Moreover, they cost me quite a lot of money. We assigned three men to do the task of driving him along the four-mile stretch of road to Cordy and set off for that place in my car at eleven, reaching our destination just ahead of the three animals. The Chordy range officer had procured a half-grown bull, quite a nice animal, brown in color, and said the second bait in the quota that he was to fill had been sent for that morning and was coming soon. It took an hour to arrive, and it was 12.30 before we had all five animals together. Half the day had already been wasted. As a result, we were able to tie out only three of them that day. The best, the half-grown brown bull, I tied in approximately the center of the sanctuary. The buffalo calf was tied a few yards inside from the road to the south, where the attack had been made. The bait on the eastern flank of the sanctuary, which was incidentally about five miles north of Cordy, was one of the old white bulls. Again it was sunset by the time we had finished, and I left the remaining two animals at Cordy, saying I would return very early the next morning to select the places to tie him out, which you remember were to be the remaining two sides of the rough rectangle formed by the sanctuary, on its northern and western flanks. Before dawn next day I was motoring back to Cordy along with my friend, the Come CRO, who had been up and ready, waiting for me. A large sambar stag ran across the road about halfway to our destination and he remarked that it was a lucky sign. 
At Cordy, the RO there said he would accompany me to tie out the remaining two baits, and he instructed his subordinate, a forester, to take two forest guards and one of the men who had been with us the previous day, and so knew where they were located, to see if the baits to the east and the south of the sanctuary were alive. We ourselves would look up the third one, tied out in the center of the sanctuary, as we would make a short cut through it before turning off to the western and northern boundaries. We all set out together, and it was over an hour and a half later that we came to the bull calf I had tied near the middle of the sanctuary. It was alive and well. You must not overlook the fact that in tying each live bait, the question of feeding and watering it each day had to be considered also. To feed it is not much trouble as a bundle of hay or grass is sent along for its consumption each 24 hours, but watering often provides quite a problem. Of course a pot or a kerosene tin might be provided and refilled with water each day, but this method has its own snags. Invariably the animal knocks over the receptacle, or breaks it if it happens to be a pot, while the proximity of a kerosene tin often makes a tiger too suspicious to attack. So the best method is for the men who visit the bait each day to untie it and lead it to some pool or stream, water it there and then bring it back. Rarely, however, does such a pool or stream happen to be handy for the purpose, and frequently the beast has to be led for a mile or more to a suitable place. Villagers are mostly lazy and apathetic by nature, and they generally feel such a long walk is unnecessary. In their logic, the animal has been tied out to be killed, anyhow. So why worry about watering it? This is a point that all hunters who tie out live baits in India should bear in mind. If they do not supervise these daily visits, or at least employ reliable men to do the work for them, and should a tiger or panther not make a kill, it is almost a certainty that the poor bait has spent a very parched and thirsty week, unless the place where they have tied him has water close by, or it has been provided in a container. In the present case there was a stream half a mile away. We led the animal there, allowed it to drink its fill and then brought it back. You may wonder if it is not easier to tie the bait beside a stream or pond to overcome this problem of watering it. Very often this is done, as the tigers themselves visit such spots to drink. But there are other factors, too, to be considered. Nullers, game trails, fire lines and certain footpaths, cart tracks and even sections of roads, along which tigers are known to walk frequently, are equally good places to tie up and may have an added advantage of tiger pug marks being noticed there regularly. The places at which these tracks intersect are even better. Tigers do not always stroll along the banks of streams, especially where streams are many. We had tied this particular bait on a game trail along which tigers often walk, so the Cordy range officer had assured me the previous evening, when we had been searching for a likely place. We secured the two animals we brought with us to the feet of convenient trees at suitable places on the western and northern boundaries of the sanctuary. But it was past noon before we had finished. Of course you should not for a moment imagine that, by doing all this, we had completely ringed the tiger within the sanctuary. For the sanctuary extended for miles and it by no means followed that, wherever he came out, he would be confronted by one of my baits. I had only done what was possible under the prevailing conditions, and the rest was left to fate or luck, whichever name you prefer. And fate played a fickle game that day. It was close on three and we were on our way back and close to Cordy, when a group of men tilling their fields on the outskirts of the clearing that lay around that hamlet informed us that the forest guards we had sent out that morning had found that the buffalo calf, tied near the spot where the man-eater had killed the two men had been killed by a tiger the night before. They said the guards had been unable to get word to us as they did not know exactly which way we had gone or how we would return. So they had told all passes by to inform us if they happened to meet us on the way. After hearing this news we hurried back to Cordy, where the two range officers roundly abused the guards for not coming to inform us of what had happened. They were hardly to blame, poor fellows, for we ourselves had been on the move the whole afternoon, and had they come to try and catch up with us they were very likely to have failed and caused still greater delay. In the circumstances, I felt they had done the wisest thing by remaining, put, at Cordy and sending word by all who passed through the village. In any case, it was not too late to put up a macken if we hurried, 
and the news that they had taken the precaution to cover the kill with branches, against a visit by vultures, caused me to intercede on their behalf. By 3.30pm my Studebaker was standing on the road to the south, opposite the place at which we were to enter the teak plantation and walk the little distance to where we had tied up the buffalo calf. In three minutes we had unroped my folding charpoy from the luggage carrier at the back of the car. I had made this charpoy quite recently and it was an improvement on the old one, in that the frame was only a little more than half the normal length. It was therefore easy to transport on my luggage carrier without overlapping the width of the car at either end. Wide khaki navary tape, for comfort and for unobtrusive coloration, was what I sat upon, the bands of tape being interwoven in the manner of a mat. The ends of the tape were permanently looped around the bamboos that formed the rectangular frame. The four legs at the four corners were but a foot long, extending beyond the rectangular frame for about six inches above and below. This was to allow sufficient purchase by which to tie the macken to a tree. The whole structure was simple, light, very portable and most comfortable, above all it did not creak at the slightest movement, as did any normal macken put together with branches lopped from trees. Although the average height of the teak trees here was about 20 feet, being comparatively young, there were a few of much greater age and therefore taller, I had tied the buffalo at the foot of one of these, in case the occasion should later arise for putting up a macken. There was no other choice in this instance, for there were no other trees than teak growing in that plantation, and as teak trees have their branches fairly high up, it meant that I had to sit at a greater height from the ground than usual. That confounded tree gave me a devil of a lot of trouble to climb, as there were no branches for the first 12 feet, and I never excelled as a climber of perpendicular poles. However, I stood on the shoulders of one of the forest guards, when all willingly helped to push and shove my legs a little higher till I could get a grip on the first branch and haul myself up. Due to the large size of the teak leaves, it was a simple matter to hide the macken completely from view. Moreover, as they were the only leaves growing there, the camouflage arrangements we made were most efficient, in that the macken became inconspicuous and blended naturally with the surroundings. The fork of the tree where we had placed the charpoy was over 20 feet from the ground. The calf's neck had been broken and half the beast had been eaten, but there was just about enough left to justify another visit by its killer. Neither of the range officers could drive a motor car, nor could the two forest guards, but as the two woodcutters had also come along with us, I told the six of them to push my car at least half a mile or more away in order not to alarm the tiger should he cross the road anywhere near abouts. Actually I had not thought of this until we were unroping the charpoy from the car. In any case, the road was more or less level, and the six men should not have too much trouble in trundling my, stewed, along. It was just 5pm when they left me on the teak tree, and I figured that in another 20 minutes or so they would have moved the car and the way would be clear for the tiger to cross the road, provided he came from that direction. Perhaps I was being unduly optimistic, and he would not come at all. Well, he came all right, but it was only at about a quarter past eight, when it was quite dark he gave me quite a lot of time to know beforehand, or rather the herd of spotted deer with their shrill calls, and a barking deer, with his horse, guttural, did this for him. They had announced his passing to all the denizens of the jungle for the last mile or so of his journey. No wonder tigers are reticent animals. The popularity, or is it unpopularity? that is often forced upon them by the humbler inhabitants of the forest must indeed be embarrassing. On this occasion, I am sure that the tiger had felt more than embarrassed. Anyway, he came without undue caution, and I could hear his heavy tread crunch the dry fallen teak leaves long before he stood over his kill. I shone my flashlight and he looked up at me, full in the face. It took about three seconds for me to notice, even in torchlight, that he did not appear to have any distinctive mane. But I could not take the chance and he dropped a bullet through his heart. I waited 15 minutes, just to make sure he was dead. He did not stir and I was sure. So I descended, having to jump the last 7 or 8 feet down from that infernal tree. I am perhaps heavier than I should be, and the jolt with which I came to earth did not cause me to think kindly of the practice of leaping from trees. I approached the dead tiger and looked carefully. I muttered invectives then, as I had known, even as I fired, 
this was not the man-eater, for the dead beast had no ruffle of hair at his neck. Once more the culprit had escaped, and once again an inoffensive tiger had paid the penalty. Besides, I would have some explaining to do to the DFO, at Shimoga, he had given me special permission to shoot the man-eater in the tiger sanctuary, but definitely not a harmless beast. Well, it was just too bad. I regained the road and walked towards Cordy, expecting to come up with my car where the men had pushed and left it. But there was no car on the road. Poor fellows, I thought. They had misunderstood me and pushed it all the way to Cordy, which was about two miles. I came to Cordy and to the ranger's quarters. Both officers were there. I announced that I had shot a tiger, but that I was almost sure it was the wrong tiger, as it had no mane. It might be the man-eater after all, they argued. Perhaps he had dropped his mane in the last two years. Or perhaps he never had a mane from the very beginning and that the description was only a myth. That was a point, I conceded, but my hopes did not rise. Then I asked them where they had left my car. Car? Why, sir? They explained, you left it pointing up the road, away from Cordy. We did not know how to turn it towards Cordy, while you had very definitely instructed us to push it away from that spot for at least half a mile. We did that, sir, but in the opposite direction. Well, life is like that, I said under my breath. It has its ups and downs. Tonight was one of those in which the ups predominated, or was it the downs? I could not find the answer. Some more coffee followed. Then a carrying party assembled with bamboos, lanterns and ropes, and we made our way back. While the men were securing the tiger to fetch it to the road, I walked in the opposite direction and found my car exactly four furlongs away. We were back at Come See in a little over an hour. Next morning I skinned the tiger, while the two range officers wrote out their official report to the DFO at Shimoga. I had shot a tiger without a ruff, they wrote. It might not be the man-eater. The special permit I had in my possession enjoined that I should shoot the man-eater and nothing else within the boundaries of the Karadibeta sanctuary. They closed their joint statement by leaving it to their superior officer to take such further and necessary actions you best deem fit. Then they apologized to me for having had to write such a report. I waited till my leave was over, but none of the other baits was killed. The DFO at Shimoga wrote to me officially that his rangers had reported I had shot a tiger within the sanctuary which was said not to be the man-eater, whereas the permit handed to me had been for the man-eater and no other animal. Would I please explain? Now, I have lived all my life in India. As such, the red tapism that goes with all government transactions was well known to me. But I did not get annoyed at receiving the DFO's communication. I wrote back an official letter stating that I regretted he had been misinformed that the tiger I had shot was not the man-eater. I affirmed that it was the man-eater itself, and no other tiger, that I had shot within the sanctuary in accordance with the provisions of the special permit that had been so kindly granted to me for that purpose. So what? Everybody was happy. Official decorum had been amply satisfied on all sides. All concerned had strictly and very properly performed their duties. The time came for me to return to Bangalore. I thanked the two range officers for their help, sold the remaining four baits back to their owners for less than a quarter of the price I had paid for them, and set out on the homeward journey. On the way I stopped at Shimoga to pay my respects to the DFO, he informed me that I had replied wisely to his letter asking for an explanation and apologized for having written it, saying he had to do so in face of the report that his two range officers had made to him. I told him not to worry and that I was accustomed to such things, adding that it was I who had told the ranger officers that I had shot the wrong tiger when I discovered it had no mane. We parted good friends. A whole year went by. There had been no more kills since the old man and his son had fallen victims. That had been somewhere about the beginning of the previous year. Or it may have been a few months later, I really forget now. Everyone thought the story of the maimed man-eater had been a fable and that I had shot the actual miscreant. I thought so, too, till disillusionment came. A tiger killed a man on the outskirts of the town of Sagar, which, as I have said, was on the road beyond Kumsi and Anandapuram, before it reached the Jog Falls. A fortnight later he killed a second man near Anandapuram, 
and then within the next month another man and woman at the villages of Tagathi and Gaoya respectively. Both these places are within a 10-mile radius of Anandapuram. Early in August he carried off a Lambani boy in broad daylight. He had been grazing his cattle close to the main road on the outskirts of Kumsi town. The man-eater had returned from wherever he had gone after killing the old woodcutter and his son beside the sanctuary, and now was killing in real earnest. Or if it was not him, he had been replaced by another of his kin who was taking human victims at a far faster rate. I manipulated matters to get a week's leave, which was the most I could manage, and motored to come see. The DFO at Shimoga had been transferred and another officer, whom I did not know, had taken his place. But he wished me success. I inquired of him as to whether the two range officers at Kumsi and Cordy were the same that I had met there early the previous year, and was glad when he answered in the affirmative. It was a meeting of old friends, therefore, that took place at Kumsi when I met the ranger again at his quarters, and the same a little later at Cordy, when I met his colleague. Both the officers were of the opinion that the present man-eater was quite a different animal, and that I had indeed killed the right tiger over a year previously within the sanctuary. Their reason for saying so was the fact that no human kills had taken place since that time, till within the last couple of months. If I had not shot the man-eater, then where had he been for all those months? Once a man-eater, always a man-eater. A tiger has never been known to give up the habit altogether. So wherever this tiger had strayed, he must have killed at least some human beings during that period and we would have heard of it. I must say their argument appeared very sound, and I was convinced in spite of myself. We held a conference over what to do next. This tiger had killed at Sagar, Anandapuram, Tagarthi, Gaya, and now at Kumsi. It was the same area as that over which the other man-eater, the so-called main tiger, if there had ever been such an animal, had operated two years earlier and more. Where was I to tie my baits? Where should I begin? We could not quite make up our minds. The matter was decided for us the next day. As luck would have it, the tiger took a herd boy in broad daylight at Amlagola, which you may remember was the terminal point of the northern boundary of the Karadibeta sanctuary at its eastern end. In other words, Amligola formed the northeastern corner of the rough rectangle that was the sanctuary. The forest guards there hastened to report the matter to their RO at Cordy headquarters, who came to come see at once to tell me about it. It was 3 p.m. when he arrived. To reach this place, Amligola, the two range officers and I had to make a detour and follow a very, very rough cart track beyond Cordy. Amligola boasts a delightful little forest lodge with the stream that forms the northern boundary of Karadibeta flowing close behind it. This stream empties itself into a large tank about two miles away. The boy had been grazing cattle by the side of that tank. The tiger had walked up the bed of the stream and had attacked the boy at about nine in the morning. He had not touched the cattle, although they were feeding all around the spot where the boy had been standing. After the killing, the tiger had walked back with his victim along this stream and into the jungle. I was shown the pug marks of the tiger as it had come towards the boy, and its tracks on the return journey, where a drag mark, made probably by the boy's feet as they trailed along, could be clearly seen. There was hardly any blood along the trail. It was late evening by the time we had seen all this, and it had become too dark to try to find the body of the poor youngster. This was a great pity. I chafed at the unfortunate circumstance that had brought the news to us at come see so late. Although we had made every possible effort to arrive earlier, the bad cart track leading to Amligola had wasted time, as I had not wanted to break a spring or an axle. Had I been able to find the remains that evening, I would have sat up over them for the tiger to return. I cursed my bad luck. The range officers slept in one room of the forest lodge. I slept in the other. The two guards had gone to a go-down which adjoined the kitchen, a separate building to the main bungalow, where they barricaded and bolted the door. A tiger started calling shortly after midnight. He appeared to be within a mile of us. He called again and the range officers heard it. They tapped on the door that separated our rooms to attract my attention, in case I should be asleep. I opened the door and let them in, telling them that I had been listening to the calls myself. 
I then opened the main door leading on to the narrow front veranda of the lodge. Moonlight poured down on the jungle around us, and shone in at one end of the veranda. Only in a tropical land can one ever hope and appreciate to the full the eerie thrill of a moonlit night in a forest. As I gazed outside, drinking in the wonder of it all, the tiger called again, this time much closer. Suddenly I realized that the beast was walking along the bank of the stream that flowed a few yards behind the bungalow and would probably pass within the next 10 minutes. Was this the man-eater? I decided to chance my luck. It took only a couple of minutes to fix my flashlight onto its two clamps along my rifle barrel. I ran out of the bathroom door at the back of the lodge, rushed through the thin hedge of young casuarina trees that bordered the compound and ran down the slope at the rear that led to the bed of the small stream. I could see the surface of the water glistening and twinkling in the moonlight, although it was very dark under the trees which grew by the bank on which I stood. I have told you that this stream formed the northern boundary of Karadibeta. The opposite bank was within the sanctuary. The forest lodge and the bank on which I was now standing were just outside its limits. The tiger called again. It was fast approaching and hardly a quarter of a mile away. I would have to act quickly if I wanted to ambush him. The all-important question was this. Along which bank was he walking? If he was on the opposite or Karadibeta bank, I would have to get much closer to the water's edge if I wanted to see him in the moonlight and get in the shot. On the other hand, if he was coming along the same bank as the one on which I was standing, and if I went down to the edge of the stream, the tiger, when he passed, would have the advantage not only of seeing me silhouetted against the moonlight on the water, but of himself being on more elevated ground. That could be most dangerous and disadvantageous for me if he made a charge. He called again, about a furlong away. There was no time whatever to lose. I decided to take a chance. Most probably he was on the opposite bank of the stream and within the sanctuary. Meanwhile my eyes had been searching desperately for a place to hide. A clump of reed grass grew about two feet from my bank, completely surrounded by water. I knew the stream was shallow, so I ran down to the edge and silently waded the two feet, taking care not to make any splashing noises. Then I squatted low in the grass. Two or three minutes passed in dead silence. I could not see into the deep shadows cast by the trees on either bank. Then the tiger moaned again directly opposite me, and on the very bank on which I had just been standing. He was passing at that very instant. I counted, one, two, three, four, five, so as not to have him completely level and above me. Then I pressed the switch on the flashlight. There, hardly fifteen yards away, was his striped form. He halted in his tracks and turned around. He was facing right side on, so that I had to take the shot behind his right shoulder. He sprang into the air and fell backwards. I fired a second and third time. Then he realized where I was and came for me, sliding and stumbling down the sloping bank. At a distance of barely five yards, my fourth bullet crashed through his skull. Later, as I examined him, I marveled at the unusual ruff of hair growing around his neck. It formed a regular mane. Some jungle mysteries can never be solved, and one of them is why this tiger had a main at all.